Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Michi Katanese, and I am the Product Marketing Manager with Smith Micro Software. Uh, today we have the Anime Studio 11 new features overview, and so we're really excited to bring this to you. I'm here with members of the Anime Studio team, including Mike Clifton, Fahim Niaz, and Jason Cozy. Um, Anime Studio is here. We're really excited, and we can't wait to show you um, all the new features. And with that, um, I would just want to say that all attendees today are muted. Uh, we will have a brief question and answer session, session at the end of the webinar. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in your questions window, and we'll try to get to all your questions at the end. Uh, we expect a lot of questions, so we may go over a few minutes. Um, if you can hang with us, that would be great. And if you need to drop off, we will understand. So with that, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Mike Clifton, and he will give you the new features presentation. Welcome, everybody. Oh, here's my screen. OK, I think my screen is showing now. I'm going to start off with some of the um, some quick features while we make sure everybody gets a chance to join the webinar. So we're going to go over a few new things in Anime Studio. First, I'm going to show you the preferences dialog. The preferences dialog in the last few versions has grown and grown, so there were tons of checkboxes and options and ways you could configure the program. But we've simplified things and broken it up into categories. So now we have some general preferences things related to document saving and loading, creating new layers and objects, preferences here specific to the timeline, tools. So this just organizes the preferences dialog, makes it a little easier for you to navigate and find what you're looking for. Um, look for this one too. There's a new t tool layout option where you can control what tools appear, what categories they're in, and what order. If you have favorite tools that you want to group together, you can customize that here. There's also a, a tool for um, classic point editing. So we used to use the spacebar to weld points, bind things to bones, create shapes, and that's still true if you have classic point editing turned on, but you can turn it off and we uh, use the return key now instead. That saves the spacebar for playback of the timeline. That's just a quick look at the preferences dialog. There's also, um, when you create documents now in Anime Studio 11, there are new default settings for the camera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import a little object here. Let's import a 3D model. And I'm going to auto size it. Actually, I have this set up already. So here's the 3D model. When I rotate it around, you can see that it's fully 3D. It used to be in previous versions of Anime Studio that our default camera was very wide angle. So you had a lot of sort of distortion of 3D objects. The new setting in Anime Studio 11 gives us a field of view of 30 degrees, which is equivalent in 35 millimeter lens terms to 44, about 45 millimeter lens. So this is new too. If you like to work in lens terminology, you can set the uh, the focal length of the lens here and adjust the field of view here. So this is more uh, a more typical field of view than the wide angle we used to have before. As we're looking at 3D, I'm going to show you another little feature here. We can show the 3D axes. So if you turn this on and then we start looking around, you could see red, green, and blue. If you think red, green, and blue order, that's X, Y, and Z. So this gives you a little indication of which direction is X, Y, and Z when you're entering things numerically. If you're adjusting the position of this object, let's say, and I change the X position, it moves in the X direction, Y, or Z forward and back. Just gives you a little reference point for working with 3D scenes. Um, another new feature is with the batch exporter. So I'm going to show you here the batch exporter. 
we've added a lot of power here to the batch export options. So I'm going to, um, one of the things we've created is this uh, profile, the notion of profiles. So if I load a profile, what a profile is, um, got moved, I think. Going to load it this way. If I drag a bunch of files into the batch export window, I can save the entire thing. So if I have a set of files that I export together a lot, I can save all these files along with the render settings as a profile. And then I can reselect it again from this profile menu. Um, if it's the kind of project I'm working on over and over again and I want to export it every day, you can save all your settings and reload it to export. There's also um, configurations. So a configuration is a set of all these properties. So if you want to create a new configuration, you can choose um, a new configuration, give it a name, and then you can choose what render settings you want to go with that. <clears throat> so I can turn off anti-aliased edges. So let's say a half dimension, half frame rate. Maybe this is one for a quick preview. Um, and I could say done, and whenever I want to apply that, I choose that configuration and it gets applied in the batch window. I'm going to move on to the next feature here and talk about the new file format. So you'll notice in Anime Studio 11 that the new file format ends with a .anime extension. So we added an I here. The new file format has a few benefits for you. Um, it's smaller in size, the, it's quicker to load and to save, and we've designed this file format to have better compatibility for the future. So when we get to Anime Studio 12, Anime Studio 11 will still be able to load those files, and if we have other, um, if you use our Motion Artist product, you'll be able to load those files in Motion Artist as well, and so we'll have better forward and backwards compatibility with this new file format. If you're technically inclined, the file format is based on JSON, which is a standard that uh, we're making use of, and you can edit it in a text editor, or there are specific JSON editors to give you the power to um, edit it in a sort of a tree view or an organized way. For most people, you'll just work with this file format and you won't really need to think about it too much, but for power users, there's a lot of flexibility in this new new format. And we still uh, load the old formats, of course. All right, one more thing I'm going to show you is some new features in the library. So here's our, our library. One of the new things we've added in Anime Studio 11 is the ability to save styles. So here I have some example styles. We have some uh, hair effects, ink effects, and different uh, sort of color palettes and fill and stroke styles that go with some of the built-in characters. You can add your own styles to the library or you can import these. So let's say I double click the hair. Now if I look in my style palette, I have all these hair um, effects added to my current document. So I can make use of, say, the tune hair effect to draw a hair style brush. All right, I think um, we're ready to move on to some of the, the more meaty features that we want to show you in Anime Studio 11. The first one is something people have been asking for for a long time, and that's frame by frame animation. So Anime Studio was designed originally to work with bones and rigging to create characters where you can just bend them around and easily move them, but there are certain styles of animation that are difficult to do that way. So as an example, here's a water droplet animation. I'm going to play it and, and I'll scrub through it a little slower. I don't know if full speed. So as you can see, this kind of effect would be difficult to rig with bones. It's a lot easier to draw this one frame at a time. And so with a frame by frame animation, I can go in and I can use all our tools, like say the, um, the freehand tool, and I can draw stuff 
on every frame. And I'm going to show you how to create this from scratch. But this is the kind of effect that, that, that really benefits from frame by frame. So here's how to do it. A frame by frame object is just another layer in the Anime Studio world. So in the layers palette, you create a new frame by frame layer. And this gives us something that we can draw on. So let me get the freehand tool, reset color. And I'm going to draw a quick little thing. Um, I'm going to draw a little circle. And now down here you have some extra controls to add a new frame, delete, or duplicate a frame. And this number here is the interval which says how often you want a new frame to appear. So I'm going to leave it at two so that we get a new frame every, a new frame by frame every two frames in the timeline. So if I press the plus button, I get a new place I can draw a frame. There's also a shortcut you can press the F5 key, so that's what I'm going to be doing to quickly draw frames. So I press F5 and I can draw another frame, F5 and another F5. So it's really quick to draw multiple frames like this. Now, a useful feature that goes along with this is the onion skin feature, which has always been in Anime Studio but there's a dedicated button to make it quick to turn it on. So if I click that, I can now see by default one frame before the current frame, and I can add a frame ahead too. So there's my current frame. The red is what happened in the past, and the green is the future. So as I advance through this, I can sort of get a sense where the blob came from and where it's going. So now I'll keep adding some frames. And then if I go back and scrub through that, you can see that I drew a different, a different simple drawing for every frame and to create a basic animation. Let's look at another uh, more sophisticated example. This is a little samurai warrior that was animated frame by frame. And what I can do is, this one's already drawn, but I'll go in and use the blob brush. And I'm going to color this character. Let's make it a little uh, more transparent. So I can draw a little bit and I'm using my arrow keys to advance to the next frame and just paint, paint, paint. Go ahead. So you can see it's quite easy to go from one frame to the next drawing as you go. I'm going to come back to frame by frame in a little bit because it, it fits together with some of the other new features in version 11. But this is the basic idea. You just, with a frame by frame layer, you're able to draw a unique picture whenever you want to in the middle of your animation or a whole sequence of frames. So like I said, we'll come back to that, but I'm going to show you a, another feature called layer referencing. Let me close some of these. Layer referencing allows you to create copies of a layer that all have knowledge about where they came from. So I'm going to do a simple example here first. Let's create um, a simple shape. I'm just going to make a little star. Now in the layers palette, we have new layer, duplicate layer, and here's a new button, reference layer. So if I click this, let's click it a few times, I'm creating basically a duplicate of the star, but you see this little arrow here, this little arrow icon tells us that this layer references some other. So all of these are a copy that point back to the original. So now I'm going to take these copies and I'm going to sort of move them around. Just place them around the screen. And then I'm going to go back to the original layer, which is this one here. 
And if I modify the original layer, so let's say I decide I want a different color, all the copies get modified as well. And so I can change the points on this layer too. I can change the curvature or the width of a line. So any animatable property you can change in the original layer and it'll change in all the copies. I can animate this as well. So if I move these points around and say rotate it, all the copies move. Now if I want one of the copies to not follow exactly with the original layer, I can go into that copy. So let's say this one, actually let's choose this one over here. And I want this one to be maybe a different color. So I'll make this one red. Now it doesn't follow color-wise with the original, but it still follows as far as the points go. So if I move points, it still has a connection to the original's points. Now these are copies within a document, and here's another, let's look at another example of um, Here's an example of referencing used inside a document. So if we look at this animation, the space woman is walking and there's a reflection of her on, on the shiny ground. That reflection is created by duplicating the space woman. So this is the original space woman character. She was duplicated as a reference, as we can see the arrow here, and the reference was flipped upside down. So now whenever the space woman is modified, so if I move her feet, the reflection moves with her. So it's really easy to create a copy of something that follows with the original. <laughs> um, so that's, that's simple referencing within a document. There's another important use of referencing, and that's as a way to collaborate with multiple artists or animators. So I'm going to show you how that works. Here's a new document. And let's say I have, so we're going to imagine now that I'm not the only person working on this document. So I'm, I'm creating the scene, but we have maybe a background artist and a character artist who are working with me. So the background artist has created this background file and given it to me and I import it into my scene. This is something we've always been able to do is import one object into another scene. In this case, we, we've got a sort of a sketch of a background. There's a new option here, import by reference. If I select that as I import the document, and then we look here in the layers palette, we see that arrow icon again. And the arrow is telling us that this object is referencing some external file. <coughs> Excuse me. The green indicates that it's up to date. And Anime Studio will keep track of that external file. So right now we just have a sketch of a background and the camera sort of pans across it. So that's all working. That's just a simple background. And now we're going to import another object. So the character artist has given us this gorilla file. We import the gorilla. And we're also going to say import by reference. That way we keep track of where it came from. So now we play this. We have a gorilla moving across a background. And I'm going ahead and I'm working on this scene. So I say move the gorilla's arm around, put this one up here, do whatever I need to do to work on the scene. And at some point, the background artist will create a new version of the background with more detail. Now, there are different ways to share files. You can use something like um, Dropbox or other sharing services. You can email files back and forth. We sort of leave that up to you how you want to to share files with one another if you're working in a team. But at some point, there's a newer background file. So let's imagine the background artist has sent me this file and it replaces the other one. So we've replaced the background with a new version. Back in Anime Studio, you can see that this background layer has a red arrow. The red indicates that it's no longer up to date, that there's a new version of the referenced file. So if I choose Update Layer Reference, there are some options for how to deal with conflicts. And the new reference layer replaces the old background. So I haven't had to change anything I'm doing. I just got a new background file. So that looks better. That looks a little more complete. And I'm still working here. And the director has seen a preview of this. And the director says, you know, we really want that gorilla to be green 
with a tail and to look a little more mean. So I'm, I'm just going ahead and I'm working on the gorilla. I'm not too worried about that. I know that, that his arm here, I wanted to be, or I wanted his arm to be up a little higher. But somewhere else, a character artist is working on the gorilla. And there's a new gorilla file now. They send it to me. It replaces the file I had. And at some point in Anime Studio, I'll see, oh, look, the gorilla has a red arrow now. So I can update it now, or I don't have to. Um, I can keep working on this version of the gorilla. And then when I'm ready to, I right click and I say update layer reference. And click OK. And now I have the new gorilla. So now the new gorilla has a tail that wags around and he's got a uh, mean looking face, but he's still got my animation. So this is a way for multiple, multiple people to collaborate, a way for you to break up a file into multiple parts and um, bring them all back together later or reuse parts. Um, the gorilla could be used in multiple projects, multiple scenes, and then updated across all of them. So now that its tail and color was changed, it could be uh, updated using this update layer reference mechanism in multiple scenes. Um, I said I was going to go back to frame by frame, so here's a, an example of how frame by frame and layer referencing can work together. So I'm starting a new document, and I'm going to create a frame by frame layer, but I'm going to plan ahead a little bit here. So it's actually called this layer line. I'm going to make a reference of this line layer and call it color. I'll put that behind the line layer. So now on the line layer, I can go ahead with some animation. So let's see, the freehand tool. Let's get a little brush going on. And I'll start making little frame by frame animation. Let's turn on onion skins again. <clears throat> So the interesting thing that's happening now is with this frame by frame, or sorry, with the reference connected to the frame by frame, right now I'm drawing on the line layer, but if I go back and I look at the, um, the color layer that I created, let's look at the color layer. Well, let's, the, the line layer, I've created a few frames here. And if I look at the color layer, you can see that it also has frames. Because it's a reference of the line layer, it has created those same frames, but they're empty right now. So now in the color layer, I can choose, um, let's use the blob brush here. And what color do we want to fill it with? The color layer is selected. I could go in and I can color each of these frames. Give myself a wider brush. So this is layer referencing combined with frame by frame to give you two copies, one to draw lines in and one to draw colors. And I have a last one here. The benefit of having them as a reference is that the, the color is totally separate from the line right now. So I can change the color. I can turn the color off, I can edit it, I can edit the lines separately. I can also change the timing. So let's say we want this frame to last much longer before it switches. The color, because it's a reference, will inherit the timing of the line layer. So this is sort of a, an advanced combination of layer referencing and frame by frame to give you more control over the drawing. Sorry, Mike. Um, there's a there's a number of questions that come in regarding uh, frame by frame and uh, reference layers. I'm not sure if you want to maybe tackle a few few of these for everybody. So um, which one are you? Which question? Well, 
uh, any any one of those listed there. So can you? Well, you said with PS. Okay, I'll I'll go through them and I'll ask them. Sorry. Um, can you use imported PSD f files for frame by frame animation? The frame by frame is um, intended to work with Anime Studio's drawing tools. So. I've been using these tools. They're still vector points. I can uh, edit them after the fact in frame by frame, so I can edit them like this. If you want to use Photoshop to draw frame by frame, you'd have to import them as separate images and uh, use a switch layer, I guess, to switch from one to the next. Okay, thank you. Uh, is it possible to use frame by frame with bones? Um, yeah, people have done that. A frame by frame layer is actually a special type of switch layer. So a switch layer allows you to use bones. So this is, um, I didn't prepare this example very well for it, but if I add some bones to this switch layer, then at some point in time, uh, I can use the bones to warp um, that frame by frame layer. So there is some ability to combine bones with frame by frame. Okay, um, is reference layer, is that compatible with the 3D layers like an imported OBJ that you showed earlier? Yeah, any layer can be referenced. The things that get uh, synced between reference layers are animated properties. So any animated property can then um, update itself from one reference layer to another. And so if I, there's one part I didn't show you here, if I create a simple reference layer. So here's my reference. When I change some property in the reference, that property shows up with a blue background. So in the channels, in the timeline channels. So this channel now, layer translation, because it has a blue background and the tooltip also tells me it's not referenced to the original anymore. So now they're independent as far as layer translation goes. So this one is independent of this one. But they still have a connection between their rotations and their scales and, and tons of other animatable properties. If I want to connect them again between their uh, translation properties, I can right-click this channel and say sync channel to original. So now they share the same translation, which, which puts them on top of each other. Uh, Mike, can you show the right click on the reference layer? Um, somebody was asking on how you find the reference, the layer that you have referenced. Yeah, so this is a, a real simple example here, but if I right click on a, so I know that this is a reference layer from the arrow. If I right click it, there's an option to locate the original layer. And what that does, it selects the layer that it came from. So in this example, there's not much to it, but if you had a very complex document with lots of groups and bone layers and things, this would find that layer wherever it was in the document. If you have an external reference, so let's say I import this gorilla as a reference, and I right click it and say locate original layer, it'll actually open the document that it came from. So this is the original document that was referenced. You can also break a reference, so if I want this gorilla not to have a connection anymore to the external file, I can say break layer reference. I'd like to, um, a couple other things, uh, I'm not, I might have missed it if you covered this, uh, if you can import object uh, objects from the library as a reference? Yeah. As well. So when you import a library document, so here are some of the new characters in Anime Studio 11. If I import this object, I get the regular insert object with the import by reference option. So I can just import it normally with no connection to the original, or if I import as a reference, then if I change the original, I can get those changes in, in my document. Great. There's uh, one other question about uh, reference files on networks, and uh, actually there's a couple questions about it, and I think I hopefully I can answer that. Um, the the user library location, your content location that you choose, uh, um, I 
you, I set that inside a Dropbox location and we shared it across multiple computers so that uh, different users can share the same Dropbox and use reference files that way if they desire as well. That's right. A lot of, we know of people who are doing that already before the referencing feature even existed um, and that works. If you use a network share, as long as um, the file is mapped to a path, if it if it can be seen as a a file on mapped to a drive location, then you can uh, use it as a reference. Um, I'm going to go on to a yeah yeah thanks for answering oh, yeah this. we can come back to more questions but we've got a lot of stuff to show too. Um, animated shape ordering this is something that another thing that people have been asking for for a long time. So when you have multiple shapes in one layer in Anime Studio, um, sorry, I'm getting a lot of echo. Is That might be my mic still. Thanks, sorry, it's hard. Okay, um, shapes in one layer have a natural ordering to them. So in this case, the blue box is the bottom most shape, and then these circles are on top of it. So if you want a shape to move behind another one, Previously in Anime Studio, you'd have to separate them into multiple layers, which depending on if you have shading effects or masking or uh, other things, you may not want to break your objects into multiple layers. But now that's it's possible to animate the, uh, the ordering of shapes within a single layer. So let's say I'm moving this ball across the blue shape, and maybe the green one moves down here. At some point, if I want the red and green shapes to move behind the blue one, it's quite easy. I can select that shape, and I'm going to use my up and down arrow keys to move it down in the shape ordering. And now you'll see as I go on, it is behind the blue shape. And the green one here, it's in front of the blue shape, but if I select it and press the down arrow, it's going to go behind the blue shape. So now we'll scrub through this animation. We can see that they're in front the balls, and now the red one goes behind the blue, and in a moment the green one will go behind the blue. And then we can change that ordering again. Later we can move the shapes back in front of the blue. So here now they're going to come back across. Let's say at this point we want the red to go in front and the green to go in front. and then maybe back behind again. So let's select that with the arrow keys, send it down, and the green one, send it down. And then we scrub through and we can see that multiple times during the animation, the balls are in front of the blue shape, then behind, back in front, and back behind again. So this is a simple example of showing how shapes can move in front of and behind each other. I've got a little bit more complex example here. This is one reason why people have been asking for this. Um, for things like head turns to give characters more depth, uh, more complexity. So here we can see that the ears and the eye, eyes of this character are changing order. So they're moving sort of in front of and behind each other dynamically to give it a a more of a 3D effect to the head turn. And if you're noticing here, this is all mapped to a smartphone. So because shape ordering is an animatable property, it can also be mapped to a smartphone. That's why we don't see any keyframes here. They're all in the smartphone action. And over on this side, I have these two boxes also mapped to a smartphone and also changing order as they move around. So that's shape ordering. Um, allows you to give sort of depth and complexity to objects within a single layer. You can see the rig here is very simple, a bone layer and a single vector layer. Animated bone parenting, this is a neat feature. Let's open up an example file. So here I have a, a bunch of bones and you can see as the crane moves, there's no connection between the crane and the robot or this little ball. 
So the bone parenting tool, we can look, the way this has always worked is that an arrow is drawn from a bone to its parent. And you can see there are absolutely no arrows between the robot and the crane. But in Anime Studio 11, you can, at any point in the timeline, change the parenting. So at this point in the timeline, I'm going to select the root bone of the robot. And then with the parenting tool, I'm going to give it a new parent, which is the crane here. And then I'm going to continue the animation. And now you'll see that the robot moves with the crane. And I can do this over and over again. So now the robot, I'm going to click the background to give it no parent at all. So this bone is isolated just on its own. And I'll keep going. I marked for myself some points in the timeline that I want to reparent things. So now I'm looking at the ball. And before I, I was selecting the, the select bone tool, you can do this all with the reparent tool. If you hold the alt key, it lets you select a bone as you click. And then with the no key modifier, you click to reparent. So now the, bow, the ball is uh, parented to the crane, and it gets lifted up. And now I'm going to zoom in here, and I'm going to reparent the ball to the head of the robot. And we'll go a little further down the timeline. And we'll reparent the ball to the hand. And then I think we're done. So. and it moves down. So I'm going to turn off the display of the bones right now. And you can see what this allows. This allows um, dynamic reparenting allows objects to pick up other objects, rigged characters to grab things or to connect to each other. Uh, they might hop into vehicles. They might pass a prop from one character to another. They might hold hands. There's all kinds of possibilities for changing the, the setup of a rig during an animation. And you can do it over and over again, as we can see here, where the crane picks up the robot, then it picks up the ball, and then it, the robot grabs the ball. So it's all very dynamic and allows you to change how a rig will work. And that's as simple as just using the reparent tool to any point in the animation, change the parent of a bone. There's a, a similar new feature, which is animated targets. So targets are, let's turn bone display back on. Targets let you control where a bone is pointing to. So in this example, there are targets here on the feet. So the green bones I'm going to be using as targets. And we can see that the legs are currently targeting those green bones. So as I move the body around, the legs try, if they can, to reach those targets. If I pull it too far, then they, they disconnect and they just they reach for them, but they can't quite touch them. So if I stay within this range, the feet stick on the targets. That's not new in Anime Studio 11. Targets were introduced in Anime Studio 10, but what I'm going to show you next is new. Um, the one thing that actually is new is that you can preview targets. Um, with the manipulate bones tool on frame zero that didn't really wasn't previewable um, in anime studio 10 but it is now which is a nice little convenient thing but the other thing is animated targets so let's play the animation real quick so the character is moving around and its feet are sticking to the targets there's this other bone sort of flying in circles and what I can do is at some point in the animation I can select the leg and then with the reparent tool, to change a target, you hold down the command or control key and you click on the bone you want to be the target. And now I'll continue the animation. So now the foot is targeting a different bone. And we'll let it do that a couple times around. And then at some point here, we're going to command click the original target on the ground and the foot is going to be stuck back to the ground. So if I play that animation, you'll see the feet are stuck to the ground. And then at some point here, it gets picked up by this rotating bone. And then it's going to stick to the ground again. 
So animated targets allow you to change at any point in the animation what um, a limb is pointing to. So it works great with legs and arms, character, things like that. Um, the crane we saw in the previous example I animated by hand, but it could have pointed at a target and it could have changed its target during the animation. So target bones are um, animated targets are sort of the counterpoint to animated parents. Instead of following a parent, you point to a target. And both can be animated now in Anime Studio 11. Next I'm going to go over some of the um, tool enhancements, some of the drawing tool enhancements. These are useful for however you're drawing in Anime Studio. They're especially useful if you're doing frame by frame. And we'll look at some of these now. So the freehand tool has a new smoothing option. So if you have it set low, it sort of behaves like the freehand tool used to. So let me get set up here for a little freehand drawing. So this is how the freehand tool works. <clears throat> So it does a little bit of smoothing to try and simplify curves, but sometimes it's hard to draw a smooth curve. Here I'm going to try and draw it with a trackpad. It's kind of hard to draw shapes with a trackpad. Um, sometimes it's hard for people, to, including me, to draw shapes with a drawing tablet. So we have smoothing options that you can turn up. And to start out, I'm going to turn it all the way up so we can really see what's going on. As I drag and start drawing, you can see that the curve is dynamically smoothing itself out behind the mouse. So this allows you to make nice smooth curves without having to draw very carefully. Um, removes a lot of jitter and noise from curves. If you're um, drawing on a drawing tablet, which I just switched to here, that may be too much smoothing. Maybe you don't want that because you can't intentionally draw a lot of detail. So you can turn down the smoothing. I like to have it on one of these middle settings. And it helps you out a little bit, but without uh, completely changing the shape of your drawing. If you don't want any help, we have a, the low option on smoothing, which doesn't do anything at all. So whatever you draw is exactly what you get. So the good artists out there that are listening, you may want this low option with no help. Um, if you want a little bit of help, you get the smoothing option. There's also a merge strokes option in the freehand tool. And what that does, previously, every time you drew a stroke, you'd get a new shape. But now, since I have merge strokes on, as I draw this shape, whatever I'm drawing, I have a lot of strokes, but they're all being merged into one. So later on, if I decide I want to edit this shape, so let's go to the select, select shape tool and click on it. It's a single shape. All the strokes have been merged into one. So I can change the stroke color altogether, and I don't have a ton of shapes that I have to deal with separately. Um, I can do things like apply a brush. And so um, if you're doing a lot of freehand drawing, you can get a single shape this way by merging the strokes. There are some new welding options as well. So auto welding. We've had auto welding before. There are two new options, trim start and trim end. And this is what that does. So let's say I want to draw a, a simple face. You may have noticed that already. It trimmed off a little bit. If I draw, let's draw a rounder face. So I have overlapping points here. When I let go of my drawing pen, those will get trimmed right off. So if I do it here again, here's an ear for this rough character. When I let go, the start and end get trimmed off. Let's say, as an example, let's say I trim just the start but not the end. So now you can see the start of the curve gets trimmed but not the end. And of course, the reverse is true. Trim the, uh, the end but not the start. And it can be done not just loops here. If I want to trim the end, I can do this and the end of the curve will get trimmed where it crosses another curve. So let's just use a... And what this does, it allows you to be um, 
a little less precise when you're drawing things and it'll clean up ends for you. Something I've been using as I'm drawing here is a way to adjust the width of the freehand tool. If I hold down the Alt key on my keyboard and I click and drag, it, it's a quick way to adjust the width of the freehand. So if you want a very thin line and then you want to switch to a nice fat line, it's just a matter of holding down the Alt key and drawing with a fatter line. We've improved the curve simplification, so I'm going to turn this down. Anime Studio tries to simplify curves when you release the mouse. So if I draw this curve and then I let go, it dynamically decides which points are necessary to draw the shape. So here we can see the points. And in areas here with not much detail, it deletes points that it thinks are unnecessary. And so this algorithm has been improved. It works with the freehand tool the blob brush and the reduce points tool. They all take advantage of that new simplification function. There's an eraser mode to the freehand tool. There's an eraser uh, tool as well, but let's turn this down. Um, so I'm gonna draw now with uh, no, uh, no smoothing happening. So if I just draw very quickly, actually I don't want welding on. So I'm just drawing some quick lines. I can go in and with my drawing pen, I can turn it upside down and use the eraser end to erase bits of the line. So it lets you, this is going to be um, useful with freehand drawing where you want to edit uh, details and draw a little more naturally. It's going to help with that. The other improvement here is that previously when you deleted an edge, so we also have the delete edge tool, um, it used to if I deleted an edge in the middle here, it would delete the entire stroke. So it would, the curve would still be there, but the stroke would be gone. Now the delete edge tool preserves the stroke, and so it just deletes that little bit of it. The blob brush also has some improvements. Here's the blob brush. There was an issue before where when you drew with the blob brush, um, let's turn on uh, stroke for this. When you drew with the blob brush, uh, let me reset that to a thin stroke. Okay, as you drew multiple strokes, the, the blob would sort of degrade over time. So you'd get sort of a, a rougher edge and every stroke would uh, degrade a little bit more than the previous one, but that doesn't happen anymore. So it maintains its quality as you keep drawing. So you can see that I can add to this shape. You can see that it's one shape because it's all, it's got one um, consistent stroke and the quality is maintained. It also takes advantage of the simplification. So this point reduction option simplifies the points. If I look at what we've got, there are areas here where the program has decided it doesn't need a lot of points to maintain the detail. And that's the simplification option at work. There's a draw behind option as well. So here, let's say I draw some freehand strokes first. And now I go back to the blob brush and I use the draw behind option. Let's turn off the stroke. Now the blob brush, when you let go, the blob will be placed behind existing strokes. So this is a way to sort of uh, make it easier to color a shape. You can draw the strokes first and then color it in and the, the color will go behind the strokes. I'll show you some new brush options. Um, So here are a couple strokes that use um, that use a brush applied to them. If I render the result, so I'm going to do Command R here. This is what the final output would look like. The top one, this is what brushes used to always look like in Anime Studio. The bottom one, you'll see there's a lot more texture in the brush, 
and this is an, a new option related to brushes. If we go into the, I selected this shape and we're going to go into the, the brush settings, there's this merge alpha option. And previous versions of Anime Studio basically always merged alpha. This shape down below has the merge alpha turned off, and that's the default is to have it turned off because we realize that more texture is better with brushes. So when you have a merged alpha brush, you get this. It has one consistent sort of coloring to it, but you don't get all the texture. So now that's up to you if you want the previous look smoother and one consistent color, or if you want more texture. There's another option, which is angle drift. So here I have a, a shape using this sort of diagonal oval brush. And there's an angle drift option. So right now it's set to zero, but I'm going to uh, turn this value up. So as I turn it up, you'll see here in the brush preview that you start to get a twist to the brush. And we can see that happening on the canvas as well. So the, the angle drift means that the brush will sort of twist along the length of the stroke. So this one, we have this sort of calligraphy type pen, and the, the more I twist it, the more twisted the stroke becomes. We'll see it with some other brushes. Here's a, some simple dots. And if I turn off the jitter, now you can see the dots just get copied along the curve. Let's bring them closer together. And now if I turn on the angle drift, as I start to turn it up, you can see that you get more and more twist to that brush. So it's another way to give variety to brushes and make them more interesting. We have a bunch of new brushes included with the program down here. There's some neat ones like hair effects. So here's a, a tune hair brush. We have a feather brush. I'm going to uh, align this one with the curve. So this gives sort of a feather effect. We can do the angle drift on this too to just get sort of an interesting furry textured look. So I'd encourage you to explore all these brushes there. Ink splatters, um, ink stroke effects, a lot of neat stuff. All right, we have some, um, we've improved the Photoshop file import in Anime Studio 11. So first I'm going to take a Photoshop file here and import it. When you import a Photoshop file, Anime asks if you want the composite image or individual layers. So I'm going to say individual layers here. So I have a little character. And there's a, a background layer, a color layer, and a line layer. So these are all layers in Photoshop. In prior versions of Anime Studio, if you added new layers or moved layers around, it would confuse Anime Studio and you'd, it would sort of could lose track of which layer was assigned from Photoshop was assigned to which layer in Anime Studio. But we've improved that now. So if I go into the Photoshop document here, I've switched to Photoshop and I'm going to create a new layer and let's call this pants. So if I go in and I paint some simple pants on this character and I save the Photoshop file, when I go back to Anime Studio, you'll see the Anime Studio has detected there's a new layer and imported that automatically. So it syncs up with the layers. It, it knows where that layer belongs between the color and the line and uh, all the other layers are preserved so they haven't been messed up. If you decide you don't want that updated layer, you can always delete it in Anime Studio and it'll still be there in the Photoshop file. But editing a Photoshop file doesn't mean that you're going to mess up your Anime Studio project. So some people like to have this, um, as opposed to using vector tools, they like to create pixel-based artwork and import Photoshop files. We're, we're a little stronger now in how we maintain those files and import them into Anime Studio. Wow, I've got a lot more stuff to show. All right, let's go to uh, bone flipping. This 12. So we've added a feature to allow us to flip bones. 
So here are uh, several rigs that are just sort of animating. And what happens, each of these rigs has a purple bone in it. I've highlighted that purple bone to show what happens when you flip a bone. So at this point in time, all the purple bones flip. I'll show you how to do that. Let's pick this one here, this arm, this bone in the arm. If I select this bone with either the select bone tool or the transform bone tool, there are two new buttons here, end flip and side flip. So if I click one of these, side flip flips the bone that way, end flip flips it end to end, which for this particular example is not that attractive, but here it lets me flip the uh, arm as if it did a twist from one side to the other. And when we look at all of these, the arm here on this side was flipped that way. When it flips across this frame, it sort of gives it a twist. And here's a full rig that sort of twists from side to side. Um, this one up here is interesting because the top bone here flips across frame 60, but because it's using flexi binding and this bone didn't flip, you get a little twist in the shape. So it's something to be aware of when you're flipping bones that you can twist shapes if they're using flexi binding. Here's an example of a character where we'll go ahead and we'll actually flip some bones around. So if I select one of his arms, I can flip that bone. Um, I can flip his body at a later time and then maybe flip this arm and then this one back down. So it allows you to sort of go from side to side by just flipping bones. That's something people have been asking for for quite a while and so it will allow you to do quick turns which you can, uh, which are sort of appropriate for 2D animation to sort of flip from one side to the other. Point colors. So here's a simple shape. There's a new color uh, color points tool, and what it allows me to do is if I select some points. So let's say I just select this point. I can now edit the color of this point. So let's choose some color there, and if I select these other points, I can apply a color to these. And what, what I'm doing here is I'm creating sort of a complex gradient effect. So I'm going to give different points different colors. So you have more control here than if you were applying a gradient that was just a linear or radial gradient. And applying points to colors works with animation. So if I move the points around, you can see that the coloration moves with the points. So you can do shading effects, um, stylistic effects, so if you don't want just a simple single color fill, you can get a complex fill. Point colors are quite powerful, they deal with holes and things, so if I want to, let's say, select the, the holes on this shape, you can also hold down the Alt key while you click in the color palette, so let's give them a, a dark color, and then the rest of the points will give them a lighter point color. And then maybe I'll select just these peaked ones and give them an even lighter color yet. And now when I render that, you can see how the colors blend from one point to the next. It's a little bit uh, chunky here in the canvas because of real-time constraints, but when you render the result, you see that you get a nice smooth blend from one region to the next. Here's an example of using some point colors on a simple arm, and I've actually, point colors are animatable, so you can change a point color during, during the animation, and because they're animatable, it also means they're compatible with smart bones. So here I have a simple um, a simple bend happening and as the arm bends it gets darker here in the middle and lighter on the outside and then when it straightens out again that color goes away. So point colors can be used on their own or animated or with smart bones. 
I like to use them for lighting. So here's a, a simple lighting example. I have a character with this lighting layer on top. And the lighting layer is using point colors on these two points. So it's, it's dark overall, but these two have a light color on them. And if I move the points, you can see that I get sort of a lighting effect. So here I can have sort of a spotlight shining down. I can move the points, and I can make the lighting come from below or from above or across the whole character. Oops. You can also adjust the strength of the point color so I can spread, make the light wider or narrower. And this is just point coloring, so it allows you to do things like simulated light. Um, I had a quick one on my list here to show grouping layers. So if I have a few layers and I want to put them all in a group, I can simply shift click to select them all. And in the new layer button, we have a new option, group with selection. So this will create a new group and put the selected layers inside it. So now I have this new group with the layers inside it. So that's a one-click way to group things instead of dragging them all in together. I have some um, timeline enhancements if we're OK to, to keep going. OK. Uh, Mike, we have reached our time for the yeah. webinar, but um, I know people would probably want to see this. So um, if you guys don't mind, we are going to go a little bit over. Mike's going to finish up showing what he has, and then we have a ton of questions. So um, we're going to stick around for a little bit and try and get to as many of these as we can. So if you need to drop off, please do so. If you can stick with us, um, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Michi, can I interject here? Um, there are well more questions than we'll, we'll be able to get to today, and um, you know we'll, we'll cover this at the end. But the forums, the Lost Marble forums, is going to be a great place to get some of those answered. So if you do drop off, make sure to visit there. Um, I'm going to just be quick here to show a few things in the timeline. Um, the way Anime Studio works is when you create animation, that channel will show up in the timeline. Uh, and it automatically decides which channels to show. We've added an option here in the View menu, Timeline Channels. It shows you a list of all channels, and you can decide which ones to show or hide. So right now, down here, I have the, the Bone Rotation Channel. And this button is set, tells it to be automatic. This button tells the channel to always show or to always hide. So in this case, I'm seeing bone rotation because I have keyframes. I'm not seeing bone translation, but if I turn on the plus for that, it will show me the bone translation channel even though there are no keyframes yet. So that allows me to go in here and say add a keyframe at this time. If I don't want to see the bone rotation channel, I can turn that off as well. So I can go to timeline channels. Even though there are keyframes in the bone angle channel, I can turn off that channel just to simplify the timeline. It gives me control over what I want to see. Um, let me turn that back on, actually, for the next thing. Delete, um, delete and copy and paste are a little smarter in this version. So it used to be if keyframes were selected, that's what you'd be working with. But now the program keeps track of where I was working last. So now I've selected points or selected bones in this character. If I copy and paste, I get a, a copy of that character. If I'm down here, even if I select these bones, but I'm down here working in the timeline, I select keys and I delete the keys delete. So it knows where you're working uh, when you press the delete key or if you use copy and paste. Um, so it has a little more context sensitivity. You don't have to be as careful about which one is selected. Hold keyframes now show up. I'm going to extend this keyframe by holding down the Alt key and dragging it to the right. So now when you hold a keyframe, it just stretches the keyframe. So we know now that this keyframe will hold 
as long as that um, sort of pill-shaped keyframe is stretched out to, it'll hold for that duration and then continue on. So we think that's just a sort of a clearer way to show that this keyframe holds its time for that long. You may have noticed in the frame by frame, it also uses this extended keyframe uh, way of showing how long a keyframe lasts. Onion skins in the timeline, we have a new button to turn them on and off. So if you have a bunch of onion skin frames, this button will turn them on and off quickly. Um, we've also defaulted to having relative frames on and um, the selected layer only on. So I think these are, we've set it up for the most common way of using onion skins. And that's just, uh, a few quick things in the timeline. I think maybe people would like to get some of the questions addressed. So I think we'll move to that. <laughs> Mute. Uh, here's a couple questions about the shape order. So is it possible to turn the shape order feature off? Yes. And you actually have to specifically turn it on. So here's the shape ordering. If you go into the layer settings dialog for a vector layer, it shows up here under the vectors tab, animated shape order. And that actually defaults to off. So you don't accidentally reorder shapes during um, during your animation and it also it's a little more expensive to for the program to manage animated shape order so if you don't need to do that for a layer you would leave this off uh, there was a question on if there was animated layer ordering as well but uh, there is la animated layer ordering now um, in a group layer this is an existing feature it's been there for a long time but if you have a group layer um, for depth sort, you can sort layers automatically by depth or you can enable animated layer order and then it, it keeps track of how you order the children during the animation and it'll um, animate that over time. Okay. Um, switching to brushes, there was a few questions regarding uh, the animation of some of the parameters of the brushes. Uh, brush parameters are not animatable. Okay, let's see. Um, switching over to reference layers. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of questions about frame by frame and I, and I just wanted to point out there'll be another webinar coming up this month. Uh, I believe that's frame by frame specifics, correct? Hopefully, we'll, we're looking into it. So, um, reference layers. Do reference layers update the actions or smartphones? They do. If you add an action to the original layer, that action will appear in the reference the next time you update it. So if, if the reference is in the same document, it'll appear immediately. If it's an external document, you have to specifically update it. Um, but actions will come in, and those can be regular actions or smart bone actions. So new actions as well as changes. So if you if you enhance a smart bone action, that will those additional keyframes or uh, animations you added to it will get updated along with other properties. Okay, and uh, somebody was concerned about uh, if they were referencing a file and the original file was overwritten, um, how that would affect the their their animation. So um, the feedback we got from our beta testers was that we didn't want, they didn't want an external reference to automatically get updated. So let's say that gorilla character I used, if, um, if that character gets updated, maybe it's being updated for a scene later in the project. So if the file gets overwritten, you don't necessarily want that to, to change a scene you're working on unless it's been, say, approved by the director or however your workflow works. So if the file gets overwritten, you'll get an indication uh, with the red reference arrow that the reference is out of date, but then it's up to you to decide when you want to update. So if, if the 
original file is completely messed up, um, you would just undo the update and get things sorted out, but nothing will happen until you initiate the update. So if you're working as a team, you'd wait for your team member to say, I'm, this file should be updated in scene 12 or however your workflow goes, but um, an update of the file won't automatically alter your your project that is using the reference. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question here about scripts. Are there, are there any new scripts for Enemy Studio 11? Um, I think there are a couple things. I don't know that I have. Um, there's one here I think that uh, automatically put some random point colors on shapes. So here it's kind of subtle, but maybe you can see uh, some variation in the shape. Um, I don't have any that I sort of prepared to show. Um. Okay. There are scripting additions, which I'll, if you're a, a person who writes your own Lua scripts, um, I, I'll go on the forum and talk about what some of the new scripting additions are for script writers. There was a qu uh, question that's kind of a basic question regarding frame by frame, and uh, they were wondering how you were advancing frames when you were doing oh, okay. frame by frame. So that's actually automatic when I in, am in frame by frame mode. This interval here uh, is showing how much to advance when I add a new frame. So every time I click the Add Frame button, it's going to go ahead by two frames. But I can set this to one or ten or whatever I want. And then when I click Add Frame, it knows that I want the next one to be ahead by ten frames in this example. I was trying to be quick before, so I was pressing the F5 key, which is a shortcut for the Add Frame of the New Frame button. And then you can just jump jump and I'm not drawing anything now but that's what's advancing the frame is the new frame button advances by this much every time so if I want to animate um, one frame at a time I would set it to one and then I start advancing by one frame every time I add a new one you can, I think you can also uh, manually move your playhead and hit the plus and it would create it yeah if I want to I'm going one frame at a time right now, but I can also jump ahead and if I add a frame now, it won't advance the frame. It advances the frame when you're on an existing frame. It advances by that much, but if you're out here where there are no other frames yet, it won't advance the time. And these are keyframes, so you can, um, you can move them around and change the timing after the fact. Um, there was a question about using re uh, skeletons or bone rigging as reference for multiple characters. Um, could you create a rig and reference it and possibly use it for two different characters? Yeah. Um, this is not going to be a sophisticated example. But, so here I created a bone layer, and I'm going to add a quick bone rig, and then I'll create a reference, and I'll add one vector layer into one, and a different vector layer into the other. This is possibly the worst example ever, <laughs> the crudest example ever. Um, and now I'm going to move this one off to the side. So they have they have different artwork in them, but you can see that the bone layer here with its arrow, I'll right click it and say locate original, is referencing this one. So now, during the animation, if I add some animation to one character, 
the other character will also get that animation. So you can be a little more sophisticated about this. You could have um, more complex characters. You could have lots of layers inside the bone layer. But in this case, it's just the bone layer that's referencing this other one. So moving the original will modify the copy. Um, cool. So another another question related to to bones. Um, is there any support for multiple smart bone actions on the same bone? Um, there's, you can have a smart bone action for each direction that the bone moves, but it's all really just one action. So when the bone rotates, that is the smart bone action. But you can have multiple things happen during the bone's rotation. So the, the rotation of the bone can uh, trigger other bones. It can change a color of a shape. It can adjust uh, shape ordering or um, any animated property, really. OK, thank you. Um, so could you bring up the, uh, the gorilla again? Did you show? Just the, uh -huh. Just the plain gorilla? Yeah. There was a question about how uh, the eyes are controlled with the gorilla. Oh, okay. So the gorilla specifically, in this case, there are smart bones, so like this menace expression is controlled by a smart bone, and the nose is the blink as well. But the eyes themselves, let's zoom in here, are normal bones. So if I translate the eyes, I'm just translating, or if I translate these eye bones, I'm just translating the eyes. So this is not a smart bone behavior, this is just standard bone movement. So even though this bone is not in the middle of the eye, the eye is bound to the bone. So this is just translation. Um, nothing um, sort of special about that. It's a little different than some of the built-in characters because a lot of the built-in characters, when you see these bones outside of the character, they're smart bones. In this case, these are just regular bones that you translate as opposed to the blink, let's say, that you rotate. That's what these arrows are supposed to indicate, is to, to translate these bones to move the eyes around. Are there any more questions, Jason? That's the video. Well, uh, I'm digging through a lot of them, and I'm hoping that uh, I've, we've covered most of these, so I apologize if we've okay. uh, overlooked um, any of the questions. Okay, well, we should probably... <laughs> You're not ready, Mike? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I, had, I had a video I was going to show real quick. This is... Um, one of our beta testers created this. He's, he's really good with um, Anime Studio in general and brushes. He created a lot of the brushes in Anime Studio 11. This is an example of a, a more complete frame-by-frame -frame style animation. So I'm going to play this video this is all created in Anime Studio. The brushes are natural looking, but it's all vector shapes in Anime Studio with the frame by frame feature. Through the webinar, it's probably coming across a little at a low frame rate, but hopefully you'll get the idea of a, an example um, frame by frame style animation. Um, we have a couple other videos to show real quick. Here's a movie. This is a feature film called Song of the Sea that came out last fall. Um, it was nominated for an Academy Award. Unfortunately, it didn't win, but this is a trailer. 
they used um, Anime Studio in this film, not exclusively, but it was used in a lot of the um, the effects in the film, a lot of the sort of magical effects, uh, plants moving around, clouds and um, vehicles, some of the secondary scenes. There's a, a some nice underwater scenes that were done using Anime Studio. I think there's a one coming up here. Here's a scene with a whale and fish and uh, underwater effects. This was all created. That scene was created with Anime Studio. This was um, made by an animation studio called Cartoon Saloon in Ireland. They are working on a TV series these days uh, called Puff and Rock. In this series, we have a little trailer here. This, um, the artwork, I believe, was drawn in Photoshop, but um, all the rigging and animation was done in Anime Studio. So Anime Studio is a big part of this production. Mike, there's when the video is over, there was a question actually regarding uh, something related to this. Uh, uh, somebody was wondering about how to get an image texture fill on your vector shape. And I know this has been in anime for a long time, but maybe just show them where it is when the, when the video is done. Sure. Here, we'll show that real quick. So there are a couple ways to do that. Um, one way is, here's a, just a simple shape. If I select that shape, here's the Select Shape tool. Click on it. There are various effects you can apply to a shape. So let's choose Image Texture. And I don't didn't prepare a particular texture. Um, I think I have one here. This is a blackboard. That might be kind of subtle. But then I have a handle here where I can move the texture around. Can you guys sort of see the blackboard texture on there? It might be kind of dark. Um, here's a test texture I use a lot. Not very exciting, but you can see that um, that it allows me to place the texture on the shape, rotate it around. I can have if I make it small, then I get copies of the texture. So that's one way to do it. The other way is uh, to import uh, an image into Anime Studio, and then you can use masking if you want to control the outline where it will appear. Do we have any? more questions we want to try and still get to. Actually, Mike, we need to wrap it up. Um, okay. We're getting near almost a half hour over. So um, I'm really sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Uh, we just got an unbelievably high number of questions. So we will address the ones that we didn't get to in the forum um, at Lost Marble Forum. And I did send out the link in um, the chat window. You all should have gotten that. Um, the webinar was recorded, and it will be posted on our website uh, by the end of today, and um, you will get a link to that in your follow-up email, so if you want to watch this again, feel free. Um, let's see here. Let me take that screen back from you, Mike. Okay. Whoops. There we go. So for more information on Anime Studio, go to anime.smithmicro.com. And to get more information on our webinars like this one or to watch the recordings, uh, go to the URL there on the screen, mysmithmicro.com forward slash webinars. There is the uh, official excuse me, the official forum for Anime Studio is lostmarble.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You see the addresses there at the bottom of your screen. <laughs> okay, I'm having trouble with PowerPoint. There we go. For the best deals on Anime Studio, subscribe to our email list. You'll also get our graphics newsletter as well and hear the latest of what's happening on all of our products. And we also have educational pricing. If you're a teacher or a student, um, go to the URL on the screen, mysmicro.com slash campus. 
So thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, sorry again that we didn't get to all your questions. And we hope to see you in the next webinar soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.